In this video, I'm going to take this live edge maple slab and turn it into a river coffee table. I've made a lot of these, but I've not actually shown it on video before. So we're going to get started on this and see how it turns out. So we start by just shortening the board. I, it was an eight foot slab and I only needed like three feet of it. So I went a little bit long on this because I know I'm going to want to cut this again after all the epoxy is done. So we're going to cut it at about 38. I set up a straight edge and I used that straight edge then with my circular saw and cut it to length. So the customer wants a two foot wide coffee table and this is actually about two foot wide right now. So what I need to do is I need to cut a section out of the middle and that way we have some room for epoxy. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut a section out of the middle, the straight edge that's formed by these two cuts I need to make will end up being the outside of the table and we'll flip the live edge to the inside of the table. And then what happens is you fill that inside with epoxy because the live edge drifts kind of like a river, they call it a river table. So um, what I need to do is figure out exactly where I need to cut out. Now I'm dealing with these two knots. Now I bought these slabs off of somebody who actually filled in some of the knots with a clear epoxy. Now I actually do that quite frequently because it stabilizes the knot. It also makes it so that there is uh, no little holes that if you were writing with a pen or something, a pencil, where it would break through the paper and go into a crack or a hole. So I'm not, you know, against what they did. However, if I got to cut a section out of the middle, I would love for it to be cutting the knots out as opposed to just cutting away some wood. So what I figured out is I want to come over to about right here on this side of the knot for this cut. And then I'm going to probably make the other cut roughly five inches away. The reason for that is you, normally I do maybe three or four, but I don't like the distance between here and this knot is about seven inches. If I only make this about three or four inches wide, this side is going to get really wide and the river is going to be way off center down the middle. So I, I want to, I'm going to create a little bit of more epoxy space in the middle and narrow this side up just a little bit so that it's a little more balanced. It's going to cost a little bit more in epoxy, but I think it'll be worth it when it uh, is done because I think it'll look better. So that's what we're going to do right now. Now I've established a line right here that I think is where I want it to be. And when I measure that, it's seven inches at the narrowest point. Down here at the end, it's about eight and a half. So if I want to balance it out, Eight and a half would be somewhere in here. Let's see, the narrowest point from this side is somewhere in here, it'd be seven. I'm just trying to find somewhere in between those two areas that would work. Um, if I go to that seven, that's almost a seven inch wide gap. I do not want to do that. If I go to this eight and a half, it's more like a four and a half inch wide gap. So I'm gonna split the difference um, actually, I'm not going to split the difference, but I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go five and a quarter, let's say. And the reason I always said that is I don't want to make this too wide because it will get expensive with that epoxy. Um, and I think that that'll still look okay. So that's what I'm going to line up and do. So all I'm going to do is come down here, make a measurement five and a quarter from the line I made. 
do the same thing down here. Five and a quarter. And I'm going to connect the two. So that's what we're going to cut out. Just like before, I set up a straight edge and I'm just going to cut again with my circular saw and cut these the slab into two different pieces, take that middle section out. Next I go over to my joiner and I just want to straighten these edges and make sure any blade marks or any uh, imperfections from that circular saw cut are removed. Um, you don't always get the nicest cut using the saw, but it's really the only way I have to do it safely. Uh, without having a straight edge on a live edge, you, you can't run it through a table saw, so uh, this is the best option. After that, we go to the miter saw, we straighten up the ends and cut them all at the same length so they fit in the form nicely. Next, I need to retape my table. This uh, is tuck tape. You can buy it on Amazon. I'll put a link in the description. And what it does is it, it prevents the epoxy from sticking to the table. Now, I've used this table so many times. You can see the old tape on there. It has just kind of gotten to the point where it needs recoded. So I'm coming back over it with some new tape. And uh, it's nice because I can just keep reusing this board. It really doesn't matter that much on the bottom how it ends up because we're going to end up sanding it and planing it and everything anyways. So, um, you know, the seams of the tape don't really matter. You just want a good coverage on the board. When working with live edge, there's always some residue left over after you remove the bark from the edge. And so you kind of have to sand that off. If you don't, it'll end up floating in the epoxy, which we don't want to do. So what I usually do is I get a Dremel out or a rotary tool and use like a flap wheel, a sanding wheel. And then I just kind of lightly clean off the edges with that. And then after I did that, if I can, I'll use my sander just to kind of finish it off. Now, you can't always do that. It just depends on the contour of the edge. But this one had some real gradual curves and I could fit that sander on there. So that's what I did. Next, we add silicone to the bottom of the ends. We also will add it to the ends of the boards there. And the whole purpose of this is to keep the epoxy from leaking out. It's extremely expensive to lose epoxy. We don't want to do that. So what I've learned over time is you need to put silicone in these spots, seals the bottom of the end piece that holds all of the epoxy in, and then also seals it against those boards. And the great thing is this is all going to get cut off because this end is not the final end. Then we screw the, uh, the ends in with pocket hole screws and I usually clean up the silicone a little bit so it's not oozing everywhere. Um, then we'll do that on the other end as well. Now before we do that, uh, we will set the width of the pieces so they're, they're an equal distance apart at both ends. And in this case, I wanted it to be two feet, so I checked both ends made sure they were both two feet. I got a clamp out. I clamped everything nice and tight and screwed the forms in and just let everything dry until the next day. Once it was all dry, I then started leveling the entire table. So I set a level on there and anywhere I thought I needed to raise or erase it, I would put a shim in underneath the, the big board that the table surface is made out of. And I would lift it anywhere it needed to go up and that way when we go to pour the epoxy everything flows nicely you don't have a deep end and a shallow end it stays nice and level so when you get to your last pour you don't have it all just pouring out the one side because because you didn't have it level next i calculated about how much epoxy it would take to fill in about an eighth of an inch on the bottom of the surface there 
And what I'm going to do is I mix the epoxy up and make sure anytime you're mixing epoxy, scrape that container really well along the sides and on the bottom uh, just to make sure you get a really good mix. Um, and then I add the color and I have a little chip brush here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour the uh, epoxy down in the bottom and then I'm going to take that brush and I'm just going to work it on the sides as well. So what we're doing is we're going to get uh, kind of some a, a coating on everything. And there's a reason for this. So all that live edge, you have open pores of wood that has air trapped in it. So if I just would go straight pour over top of that, I will have bubbles seeping out of that thing nonstop. So this is a little tip and a little trick that uh, you can get a much higher quality product out of if you just do this in advance. Uh, this is a cheap brush that I use and I just brush it on and I make sure that it's coated real well and then in the end what's going to happen is we're going to have just a really thin layer that forms in the bottom of this uh, open gap between the two slabs. There is a purpose for that. That is going to seal the underside of the two slabs so that any future pours it doesn't push epoxy up underneath to where we'll have a leak that runs out the bottom. I in the past used to silicone the bottom of these things and it made kind of a mess and I learned that all you really had to do was make sure it was sealed up on this first coat and it took care of everything. Uh, if you don't do this what ends up happening is that you pour a thicker pour in and the weight of that pour will just force it out the bottom. So this is a very important step that I highly recommend you do. So this has sat for a few days and um, I'm going to just rough this up a little bit with sandpaper. It can help it adhere to the previous layer, uh, which is recommended to do if you have an uh, extended period of time where you um, in between pours. So if you were to do the, you know, pour as soon as the, the previous coat hardened, you wouldn't have to do this probably. But um, because it's been, it's actually been like a week, it's probably best to do it. I'll blow it out. Those scratch marks will never show once the um, once the new layer gets in. So what we're using is super clear epoxy. This stuff is amazing. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, you can pour, I believe, up to like three quarters of an inch quarter of an inch at a time, my bad. So this will take a few pours here, but um, stuff works great. I mean, I, I just, it's some of the best epoxy I've used and it's, uh, it's some of the more reasonably priced epoxy I've used. So I will put a link for that into the description down below. I'm also using Bora Bora Blue from Black Diamond Pigments as the color. So that's what I'm using. Those links will be in the description. So let's get started on this pour. Now, since it says a quarter inch, I probably should do a calculation here. So the average width is about seven inches. The length is 37. So we want to get, fill an area that's seven by 37 by a quarter inch. So that's 64.75 cubic inches. We divide that number by 61 and it gives us the liters that we need for this pour and it comes out to 1.06 liters. So we're gonna mix up 
uh, right around a liter of epoxy here and uh, pour the next layer in. So we just are going to mix epoxy up and pour, let it dry, mix epoxy up and pour, let it dry. And we're just going to keep repeating that process until the entire thing is full to the top. Um, it's recommended this is, these are quarter inch deep pours. So that's what we're doing. If you go over the recommended amount, all you're doing is risking it overheating and, and causing problems. Uh, it can crack uh, because it, it can only handle so much of that chemical reaction. It, it builds up a lot of heat. So you really have to be careful with that. I have seen it crack before. It's not fun to deal with. And so it's best to avoid it. Now this company does make another product that is intended for deeper pours. I just like using this because I have a little bit more control. And, and it's also, I don't have to buy two different kinds of epoxy. I can use this for everything. Whereas the deeper pour stuff might not be quite as applicable for some shallower things that I do. So uh, I just buy this, but you could buy some of each if you needed to. Uh, it's just up to your personal preference. So we're just going to buzz through this here real quick. You'll see and some of the layers I had to sand. Some of them I re-poured quick enough that I didn't. So I think the instructions say as long as it's still slightly tacky, you can pour the next layer because by that time it had cooled and it should bond well to the previous layer. But if you miss that, you, you do need to scuff it up, and it makes no difference if you scuff it up. Uh, those scuffs will be gone, the epoxy will fill in the cracks, and it'll all be fine. So, and at the very end here, you'll see I do a little swirl, and I did this the last couple layers. I swirled the epoxy, because what happens is those pigments, they kind of tend to settle and if you swirl just dig in with a stick and just real gently you don't want to create a lot of bubbles but gently just stir it back up it kind of brings some of the different colors out in the in the pour so it's just something i like to do you don't have to do that if you don't want to the other thing i like to do is as i get close to the top i actually add a little bit less pigment each time so you can see a little bit deeper into it and just build some depth if you just make it real solid um you don't, you don't get quite as much cool effect i don't think so that's a personal preference i like to do you may want to do it just as solid as possible so but that's that's how we did it once that hardens uh we it's just time to demold it so we take the screws out of the forms and just lightly tap on them with a hammer and they should pop right off now to get the table top off of the table surface I just drive some wooden shims underneath the table surface and you have to kind of work the first one's a little tough and then as you work around the table drive another one in when there's a gap and and just keep finding gaps to drive other ones in and eventually it'll just pop right off once you have the table free you're gonna need to do something with the surface because it's not going to be level uh, either it's going to take a lot of sanding or if you can find a place that has a planer or a wide belt sander those are some quick and easy ways to get it done where it doesn't it'll save you a lot of time so i recommend trying to find a local shop that can do that for you if at all possible so i'm heading down to an ama shop right now they have a like a wide belt uh plane or a, a wide really wide surface planer and a wide belt sander all in the same machine. Uh, I usually have any of my slabs that are really big machine down there. And so we're going to take this, uh, this table down and have it machine. Uh, it's not huge, but it's big enough that I don't want to try to mess with it myself. I'm going to have to take it somewhere. This is about the best place I know of. I'm going to try to film. And sometimes Amish are a little funny about that. These guys seem pretty cool. So uh, we'll see if I can show you the process uh, of getting it smoothed out. All right, 
So that was successful. Uh, got that thing cleaned. Now I'm heading to another Amish shop that makes table legs. Uh, these are usually already pre-made and ready for me, so hopefully they have something in stock that will suit this table. So we get that, and then we'll head back into the shop. They did not have the table legs in stock, so I went back to the shop. I had them ordered, and then I just went back and decided to get everything else done. So I need to trim off both ends. So the first thing we do is cut those with a circular saw. And the first one I'm just going to cut straight. Then the second end, I actually measure the exact length of the table and make the cut that I need to make to make the final size. So we do that. Then I just, I'm just i going to sand everything really thoroughly. Uh, I start with uh, 120 grit, mostly because it came out of the sander at that. Uh, if I see any blemishes, I'll back it down to 80 and start completely over from where I would if it would never have been to the sander. And then uh, just thoroughly sand everything. I move nice and slow, try to make sure there's no swirl marks. Uh, I also suck the dust off of it with my dust collector. So uh, especially in that epoxy, if you aren't careful and your sander puts any swirls out, they'll be very evident in that sander So or in the epoxy. So you, know, you got to be careful about that. I'm extra careful and... Once I know it's good, I stop. Um, because I'm going to put stain on this, I stopped at 180 grit, mostly because I was worried that if I went much further, it would have trouble penetrating into the wood. You kind of start sealing pores up when you go much past that. And I know that my customer wanted this fairly dark, and so I had to make sure that it really soaked in well. Uh, a lot of times I use a product called Odie's Oil, that is, it has no stain in it, uh, so it really wasn't applicable in this situation, but it is a product I really love and highly recommend, especially if you just want to bring out the natural color of the wood and really make that epoxy pop. Once I'm done staining, I will use a polyurethane. I used a water-based polyurethane, and it's a brush-on. And uh, I put a lot of coats on. I very lightly sanded in between coats, cleaned all the dust off, and when I sanded it in between coats, I just used hand sandpaper and a really high grit. I think it was like 800. And so it really was just taking any bumps off that maybe from dust settling or uh, the water-based uh, finish could maybe make the grain raise a little bit. And so I was just taking those off and getting it really smooth. And I was very happy with it other than I would occasionally get some brush marks and so especially for a tabletop i didn't like it it was showing up more in the epoxy and so i decided after my very last coat of brush on i bought a can of spray on polyurethane exact same company same sheen everything and just misted a few coats of spray on just to try to make sure there were no brush marks or anything like that on the final coat so we had a real nice pristine perfect coat for my customer. So we just got back from the metal shop and I got some new legs to sell on this. And I'm gonna show you how I mount legs. So the first thing I do when I am mounting a leg is I wanna get it centered. Now, to me, the easiest way to do that is to figure out how much the overhang is and then divide by two. So what I typically do is I will push the leg up so it's flush on the one side and I will just measure how far it is to the edge from that. And we are, man, that's five and seven eighths. So uh, you got to do a little math with that. The way I always told my students to do it when, it, when it's a fraction like that that's not as easy to half, is just take half of five. So that's two and a half. Then take half of the seven eighths. Anytime you take half of a fraction, you just double the denominator. So it's half of seven eighths is seven sixteenths. So I have two and a half plus seven sixteenths that means that each overhang 
should be 2 and 15 sixteenths. So we just add the two. And uh, so 2 and a half is uh, 8 sixteenths. 8 sixteenths plus 7 sixteenths is 15 sixteenths. That's how I got that number. So what I'm going to do is uh, it's going to be 2 and 15 sixteenths from each edge. Now, the only other thing you got to decide is where I want the leg to be in relation to the end of the table. That is going to just kind of be based on looks, which I think I think three and a half inches is what we're going to go with. So two and fifteen sixteenths on each side, three and a half on the ends. And then the other end should be the exact same. And so I'm going to mark that out. And what I like to do is I like to mark where the corner goes. So I'm going to go two and 15 sixteenths right there by three and a half. Three and a half is right here. So what I'd like to do is get it so it cross, I have a little bit of like a crosshair type thing and that'll get me lined up on that corner. Never going to see this, especially if you do it in pencil. Then I like to do the other side too. So that I'm sure I got everything straight. So that should be where it goes. And by marking two corners, it also allows you to double check yourself. And that looks pretty good. I will double check my offset here. just to make sure we're consistent. And that's how you get it. Uh, what I like to do then, I like to take a punch and I'm just going to tap in where that center is. And that's going to help me with my holes. I like to avoid putting um, the bolts in the epoxy if possible. Uh, sometimes you can see them for one reason and it's just not, they, they, can, they grab but they don't grab great. So I just try to avoid that. And that's all there is to that. Now I have the dimples where each bolt goes and I'll drill those in. So I'm using a number 12 by inch and a half lag to attach these legs. I've uh, marked my drill bit at the depth I want to go. So I'm sure not to go through the top so I'm going to drill right where I have those holes marked. And the last thing I'm going to do here is just put these screws in. So we'll be done with this side and I'll do the same thing on the other.
hey, thanks for watching. As you can see, it turned out really good. The contrast between the stain color and the epoxy color looks amazing. I really think it was a good choice. Those legs are pretty cool. I've never actually used those before, but they had that cool turnbuckle in the middle of them. Just a different idea, has a really neat look to it. As you can see, it's not that hard to make one of these tables. And the great thing is it doesn't take a lot of tools. The, one of the first things I did was uh, when I had my own shop was make uh, live edge tables, epoxy tables, because you really only need a sander, a circular saw, a drill, and maybe a router. And so you could do it in a garage. You don't need like big equipment to do it. So it's a great thing to do if you're limited on a budget or limited on space. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, drop them down there in the comment section. I really appreciate you guys watching. If you could hit that subscribe button, I'm trying to drive my subscriber base up right now and it really helps me out and helps this channel grow. Check these videos out in the next screen and we'll see you next time.